One of my mentors, a former pastor, retired pastor at Dawson Memorial Baptist Church, they would have a time of prayer in their church and um, regularly where they would call people to, to the front and they would kneel down and he called it the work of the church. And I always thought that was an interesting phrase to describe what the church is about. And what we do and when we pray together is we are doing what God has called us to do and in interceding. When I just read the verse this morning in 1 Samuel 12 where Samuel is giving his farewell speech to Israel and he says, As for me, far be it for me if I fail to pray for you. And in that verse, we have this hint of the sin of failing to intercede. And uh, that's quite a strong, a strong verse for us. And so may it not be true of us that we would fail to pray on a regular basis for each other and for these broader concerns. Um, are you all ready to tackle Leviticus? Uh, we've packed the house tonight here for Leviticus, and we've packed our bellies with, with uh, carbs tonight to be able to keep us awake uh, <laughs> for Leviticus, I hope, and we can all uh, stay tuned. So I uh, hope you have a handout that you, I hope you received as you came in. We're going to do an overview of the book of Leviticus, the third book of the Bible, the third book in the first five books, the series of the Pentateuch or the Law. You'll notice there at the top that I've put um, the title uh, beside the overview of Leviticus, one little verse. And this is kind of a, if I had to summarize or pull a verse out of the book of Leviticus that kind of gives a basic summary of what the book is about, it, it is this. It is to be holy because I am holy. That's what the Lord says in many different ways, and he says it in numerous ways to Moses, to the people throughout the book of, Le of Leviticus. And then you'll see down in the content of the book and the outline that essentially you can kind of, in a way, um, divide the book in half where almost the first half of the book is about the holiness of God, about the Lord who is holy. And the second half of the book is giving kind of fleshing out specific details and commands and instructions about how we live out that holiness before God in the world. The book of, of Leviticus, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on the authorship because we've pretty much established that Moses was the, the primary author of all the first five books of the Old Testament. He is the deliverer and the lawgiver. He was the law receiver, and then he was the law giver as well. Fifty-six times in the book of Leviticus itself, it says the Lord spoke to Moses or some phrase likened to that. And so it pretty much well establishes the fact that he is the author. And then, of course, the New Testament and Jesus himself in several places refer to the law of Moses as it is quoted from the book of Leviticus. And so we know that Moses was the author. It's speculative to some degree about when this may have happened or when he may have written this. Most people seem to think that he wrote this during the time when they were around Mount Sinai during the wilderness wanderings, uh, possibly written either in 1445, which would have been closer to the time when he received the entire law. Um, when he was on the mountain with, with God, or even possibly toward the end of the 40 years of wilderness wanderings, uh, he may have penned some of these words down and handed them on. But somewhere in that time frame, most people believe this, this is when the, these writings would have occurred. The audience of the book of Leviticus, primarily when it was written, was to the nation of Israel, and it was for a specific pur purpose. I've already kind of stated it. And that is, they've just come out of Egypt They've been in slavery. They are being established as a covenant people. The book of Exodus was all about how God had established a covenant with these people and now how they were to live. And the book of Leviticus, in a way, is kind, is kind of a, an, an extension of a lot of the things that we've already studied in the book of Exodus. It's kind of a fleshing out of further details, further addendums of the laws about which to, were to govern them now as a new nation. And it is to explain how they were to approach, specifically to approach and relate with God, the God who is holy. And we're going to talk about that in a minute and all the details around that. And also how they were to live out now his holiness in everyday life and in relationships. <clears throat> so let's take a look at kind of the basic content and the layout of the book of Leviticus. In the first 10 chapters, you could kind of say it this way, it is the concept of God's holiness and then how a people of God are supposed to approach, be accepted by, and worship a holy God. Okay, um, The first six chapters, the first 
five and a half chapters through chapter six, verse seven, is God giving instructions to Moses about a series of offerings, all the first few chapters. This is why these chapters, I would say specifically, are why many people who start out the year uh, in Bible reading plans, uh, they get to these chapters and then they quit because they are very repetitive. Uh, they are very uh, kind of tedious in nature in the way that they describe these offerings. But we have instructions about the burnt offerings that were to be given, grain offerings, fellowship or peace offerings is another way that those are described, sin offerings for the guilt of unintentional sins as well as deceitful or intentional sins by the priests, by the entire community of Israel, by individual members of the community, and then also individual leaders of the community. Uh, so they cover a whole range. It's covering the entire basis for any potential sin or any actual sin on how those can be taken care of before holy God. And it's also to atone for the sin. And this is a phrase, the quote from these chapters that repeats uh, repeat, over and over again. You find this phrase, these offerings were an aroma pleasing to the Lord. And that is a very important idea throughout the book of, of Leviticus is how can God be pleased with a sinful people? And God is giving a prescription to the people of how that can be accomplished through the, this system of sacrifice and ritual and offerings. Then in chapter 6, verse 8, through chapter 7, verse 38, toward the, at the very end of the chapter, God then is giving instructions to Moses to give to Aaron and his sons who were specifically entrusted with the role of the priesthood. And he was giving them instructions about now how they were to administer all of the offerings that we've just read about in the first six chapters that God gave to Moses to give to the people. And so he gives, again, a couple of chapters are in quite painstaking detail. Here's how you're to do it. In step-by-step -step fashion, how are you to carry out these, uh, these offerings? Uh, the burnt offering, the grain offering, the sin offering, guilt offerings, the fellowship offerings. And then he splits in this chapter the idea of a fellowship offering in the form of thanksgiving to God or in the form of a vow or a pledge to God. And that's important to kind of note as a small detail here and that in all of these different expressions, we find ways that we too can worship God even as Christians today, even though it looks differently. We're not bringing grain to the church house. Uh, we're not offering up animal sacrifices anymore, but we, are all, but we are still worshiping God, and these give us ways to express on how God is to be worshiped. And then it also begins to tell us, um, and it gives a lot of other details about how they are not to eat fat or blood from these animal sacrifices, and then a little bit of a strange uh, passage uh, toward the end of chapter 7 where it describes that the breast of one of the animal sacrifices and the right thigh are reserved for the priests. Only God knows, and we can ask him when we get to heaven, why those specific parts of the animal are reserved for the priest and why the priests were instructed to walk around and waving them in their right hand. So I'm not going to be doing that anytime soon, uh, so don't worry. Uh, we'll find out maybe later why that was being done. But these were some of the instructions that were given to the priest on how they were to administer the, the, these uh, offerings. And then in chapter 8, 8 through 10, these three chapters are the description of how Aaron and his sons were then ordained. They were consecrated and ordained and commissioned by Moses for the priesthood. And they began their ministry of, the, of being priests to the nation of Israel. It describes their first act of making sacrifices and offerings unto the Lord. And then also it gives us a description of their prayer and how they blessed the people of Israel. And at the very end of, the, of chapter 9, we have this uh, picture, and we, and we probably will read a couple of verses from the end of chapter 9 at the end when we get ready to close, because it gives this description of Aaron and his sons blessing the people. And then it says that the glory of the Lord, the presence of God, came among them in their midst in that moment. And they worshiped, they fell down on their faces and they worshiped God. Um, it's one of the early, Exodus has some pictures of this, but this is one of the earliest descriptions of corporate worship and what should be happening when the people of God come together to worship a holy God in his presence. And when we come in contact with the presence of the holy God, what should be happening with us? And with these people, 
the presence of God was so manifest among them that all they needed to do was to fall down on their faces. When was the last time you fell down on your face because you were overcome with the presence of God? That's a penetrating question for all of us. In chapter 10, not only at the very end of chapter 9 and moving into the first part of chapter 10, the presence of God had become so thick and manifest among them that in the first part of chapter 10, we have this story of two men who were named, two of the fewest names that are mentioned in the book of, Le- of Leviticus, Nadab and Abihu. And these two men decided to offer up some what is called unauthorized fire in the, in the burning of incense. And then it tells us very simply that they were consumed by the fire of the Lord. Uh, We don't really know exactly what the offense was, why this was so offensive to God, but apparently it it offended his holiness so much to the point uh, that they were consumed by the fire of God that came upon them because they took matters into their own hands and they lost their sense of reverence for the holy God. And so it shows us again the importance of not only the presence of God, but the role of the priesthood in, tr- in trying to help the people of God worship God and his holiness in the, in the proper ways. And then in chapter 11, all the way down through the end of the book, this whole second half of the book is giving us a description about how now the people of God are to be holy because God's holiness has been revealed to them through these acts of worship and how we are to live. Chapter 11 through 15 These are also some of those chapters that that people are either tempted to give up their Bible reading or there's three possibilities. They give up their Bible reading or they're tempted to skip over them or they plod through them and it raises so many questions that they start emailing their preachers about what does this mean and does this apply today? Because in these chapters that has a lot of descriptions about skin diseases and infectious diseases and bodily functions. Uh, This is where middle school boys sometimes their imaginations begin to run wild when they have Bible questions uh, about all of these chapters, okay? Um, And in these chapters, the point we need to take away from these is that God takes very seriously the holiness of our lives and that the way that we conduct ourselves and the way that we present ourselves to God is very, a, a very serious matter to him and how we uh, live every single day. And all the way down to the minutest details, are we doing it as unto the Lord? And then in chapter 16, we have a little bit of a break. There, chapter 16 comes right in the middle of the book. And we have the entire chapter is a description of one specific day called the Day of Atonement. And we know the significance of the Day of Atonement for believers Uh, Jewish believers, and of course now even as Christians, uh, that concept has a great amount of significance for us. And it describes how Aaron and his sons, on that particular day, how they were to enter the sanctuary, the tent of meeting, with proper dress. There were sacrifices they had to offer for themselves to be able to enter into the sanctuary. And then there was a description of two goats that were to be selected by the casting of lots, to be determined which goat would be offered up unto the Lord as a a sin offering unto the Lord. And then the other goat, by by the casting of lots, would be released. The priest would place his hands on what is called the scapegoat and would place all of the sins of the nation of Israel from that entire year onto that goat. And then then there would be an assigned releaser of the the scapegoat would take him out to the edge of the wilderness and would release the goat into the wilderness. So therefore, on that goat, you have this beautiful picture of all the sins. So all the sins that have not been covered by all of the sacrifices and offerings in the first 10 chapters of Leviticus, as it describes all of these incredible, elaborate rituals, now there is a way for them all to be covered by this one act of this offering of the goat to the Lord and also this scapegoat released into the wilderness. It almost sounds like a little bit of gospel, right? And we have in here this picture of Jesus being our lamb and being our scapegoat for us. Um, And then it actually has some other details about even after these acts are done, how Aaron and his sons, the priests, were to take care of the clothing even that they wore in the... the, um, observance of these rituals because of how the holiness of God that was to be observed. And this was to be done every single year. Chapter 17 through 25 is a whole series of chapters dealing with very specific individual rules and, and 
instructions and commands regarding personal holiness as well as corporate holiness by the people of God. Chapter 17 is a picture is a is a description of the animal sacrifices uh, for the Lord at the tent of meeting and how they are not to, nobody is to eat any blood because and the reason why that command is in there is because they had wit, would have witnessed this among the Egyptians in some of the rituals that they performed and to the gods they worshipped. And he's telling them, you are not to do as the Egyptians did. Chapter 18 is probably one of the most um, referred to chapters in Leviticus because it is in the middle of this chapter that we find the verse that's one of the most quoted verses in the book of Leviticus where it says that a man should not lie with a man as, as he does with a woman. This is a what? An abomination unto the Lord. In this whole chapter, there are a lot, and that's only one, by the way, command among many, many having to deal with sexual purity. There's lots of other descriptions in there as well about the holiness of our, of our sex lives. And then chapter 19 is a series of lots of different kind of various applications and specific expressions that all revolve around the Ten Commandments in different ways, as well as further instructions about how God is to be properly worshipped, and also how we are to love other people and treat other people with justice and with fairness and with mercy uh, in every segment of society. Chapter 20, those who sin against God's commands, it's very clear in this chapter, they are to be cut off or they are to be put to death. And the decision about whether they are to be cut off from the community versus put to death has to do with the seriousness of their sin against God's holiness. Chapter 21, there's instructions for the priests specifically about the holiness of their own lives and how they are to live. And then chapter, I'm sorry, that was chapter 21. And then chapter 22, how the priests are to make sure that the, the offerings that the people bring to God are to be holy. They were not to be, be presented any particular way. They are to be presented in the way that God has prescribed. And this probably has some principles for us, is that God desires to be worshipped, and yes, we worship God from our hearts. He sees our hearts primarily, and the key issue in worship is our heart, but we also need to take our cues from Scripture and how God desires to be worshipped. It is not really our sole decision on how we decide to worship God. And the book of Leviticus teaches us very clearly that certainly during this day that not only was he to be worshipped, not only was he to be honored and held up as holy, but it had to be done a particular way, and he meant business by it. And I think there's some principles for us to learn and for us to teach about the importance of worship and how God is to be approached. And then in chapter 23, the people were to observe Sabbath and all of this series of appointed feasts. There was the Passover, there was the unleavened bread, the first fruits, the weeks, the trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. All of these feasts, they were to be held every single year as sacred assemblies. These were the times that the entire community would gather together. And if there were other, you, we might hear a little bit about this next week when uh, Grant tackles the book of Numbers. But there's actually some hints in that book and even a couple of stories that talk about that people that if they forsook the, these gatherings, if they just did not show up for the celebration of Passover, there were some dire consequences uh, for the people of God if they ignored these commands about how God was to be worshipped. Chapter 24, basically don't neglect the oil for the lamps or the bread for the table of presence in the tent of meeting. Very specific details to the priest about how those items were to be handled in the temple. Do you think, do you believe that everything matters to God? Everything matters to God. Down to the oil and the lamps. Down to the bread as it's spread out on the table of presence. Everything matters to God. The end of chapter 24, we have another story of a blasphemer who blasphemes the name of God and God himself says, put him to death. I have no explanation for that. It's one of those texts in the Old Testament that an atheist would have an objection to. They would, they would reject the entire word of God based on one, upon a story like that. I cannot love or worship or believe in a God that would do such a thing. The book of Exodus is proclaiming to us, even with a story like that, trying to hold up in front of us, that is how holy God is. We need to read a story like that in context. What Leviticus is proclaiming is that God is holy. Holy. And we forget 
how holy God is, we want to champion the love of God, and of course he's loving and gracious. As a matter of fact, another theme that's running throughout Leviticus is that all of these instructions given to the people of God about how he is to be approached and worshipped is an act of his love, because if he had not done that, so many people would have approached him in the wrong way and would have been killed in trying to approach a holy God in the wrong way. And so God is giving us a gracious gift by giving us instructions about how he is to be related to and worshipped. In chapter 25, it's the whole story, it's all the descriptions about the Sabbath year and the Jubilee year. So when was the Sabbath year? Anybody know? It was every how many years? It was the seventh year, okay? The land was to be, um, ha- experience a Sabbath. They were not to do any a farming, there was not to be anything done in the seventh year on the land. Then the ha- other half of the chapter is describing the year of Jubilee, which happened in which year? 49th. The 49th, uh, leading into the 50th year. And at that year, the, all the different, everyone who was like a slave or a servant, and also property, land, uh, family, heirlooms, all these different things would go back to their original owners in that particular year on the 50th year. That sounds probably to us like a horrible idea, doesn't it? Who wants to give up all of their property uh, in the 50th year? It sounds almost unfair, doesn't it? But there was certainly a purpose behind that. It was a, it was a purpose of justice. It was a purpose of trying to remind the people that what you have is not yours. It belongs to the Lord. And it belongs to the community of God's covenant people. That was part of the purpose behind these acts. And then in chapter 26, that whole chapter is now at the end of this book describing the blessings that come from those who will honor and keep these commands that you've just received. And here's also a warning of all the curses and the punishments that come on those who choose to ignore or disobey all of the commands that I have now given you uh, through my servant Moses. And we're actually going to read a, a short passage from there as, uh, as a way of closing here in just a few moments because it's, be- it's a beautiful passage to, that b- should hopefully bring inspiration to us about why we should choose to be faithful. Chapter 27, are all the items dedicated to God is a description of how all those items that are brought to the, the sanctuary for Uh, these offerings of worship, they can be redeemed back. And they actually describe how you add a fifth of the value to it. You can purchase it back uh, for 20% interest on that that, uh, value. Items that are devoted to God, however, specifically, there is a way for someone to offer a gift unto God in what is referred to as a a devoted offering or an irrevocable devotion to God. Those things could not be redeemed back. And then also at the very end of that book, um, this is another reason why some people might, might, they might skip this chapter and go on to Numbers, um, is because it starts talking about tithing. Uh, Everybody's favorite passage of scripture, uh, that a tenth of everything belongs unto the Lord. Now let me just kind of run through real quickly some some reflections on this book of Leviticus that I believe are some some contributions this book makes uh, to the gospel, our understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ and how uh, the, some applications for us. First of all, God's nature and his character are revealed as holy. I've already talked about this a lot and how he must be worshiped in an acceptable way. And I put there some of the passages there that refer to that and also some New Testament references that talk about um, how we are to worship God with holiness and awe. Our sin must be atoned to make us acceptable to God, to come into his presence. In other words, God does not wink at our sin. He doesn't doesn't ignore our sin. He doesn't just wave it off and say, oh, that's okay. No, there must be a sacrifice to atone for sin. God's holiness requires it. His eternal holiness, his infinite holiness requires that a price must be paid. We owe a debt because of our sin. This is what Leviticus is telling us over and over and over again. And then... Also, the warning that comes, unrepentant sin. We see it in the story of of Nahab and Abihu. The unrepentant sin, the irreverence before God is dangerous. It's dangerous. But God has graciously provided for us atonement for our sin through the sacrifice of blood. It's through the blood sacrificial system of the animals that are described in so many ways throughout the book of Leviticus that is the 
gift that he's given to us that with the offering of blood, because it is the life source, God will accept those offerings as payment for our sin that we owe against God. And Hebrews 9.22 basically says, and it is without the, the, uh, the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Okay? And this is, a, this is hearkening back to uh, the book of, of Leviticus and the importance of blood being shed uh, to make atonement. And then it also points us forward to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. This is one big, huge pointer toward the gospel of Jesus dying on the cross for us. His sufficient once and for all sacrifice as our sacrificial lamb and as our scapegoat. John 129, John is pointing to Jesus and says, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The New Testament proclaims and understood Jesus to be that Lamb who fulfills all of these Old Testament sacrifices, so no longer does any sacrifice need to be made. Jesus has made it once and for all. And our faith in Christ's sacrifice on the cross provides atonement for our sin, forgiveness for our sins. In him, meaning Jesus, this is Ephesians 1, 7, in him, meaning Jesus, we have forgiveness through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. We are to gather regularly. This is another teaching in Leviticus, I believe, for us as God's people. We are to gather regularly to offer our worship to God as sacrifices of praise, sacrifices of obedience, sacrifices of giving, and sacrifices of our service to God and to each other through the name of Jesus Christ. And part of where I get that from is Hebrews 13, 15, that talks about the fruit of our lips is the sacrifices of praise that we offer to God through the name of Jesus Christ. This is now the nature of Christian worship, but the foundation has been laid throughout the book of Leviticus on how holy God is to be worshipped. And now also we have been made a kingdom of priests together to serve our God together, and to serve one another. We now have, each of us, the responsibility, the duty, and the authority in the name of Jesus Christ to intercede for one another before the throne of God, right? So I am not, I am not your Moses. I am not Aaron, right? We are all Moses and Aaron to one another through Jesus Christ, who is our ultimate Moses and Aaron, who has fulfilled this entire priesthood system. And then through our faith in him, now we offer our worship to God and we offer our prayers and our intercession to God on one another's behalf. And then we are to please God through our obedience and purity in every area of life and relationship. Romans 13, verses 11 through 14, that little passage ends with, Rather, do not think about how to gratify the desires of your sinful nature, but rather clothe yourselves in the Lord Jesus Christ. It describes how now we are to put off the old and put on the new. We are to be holy people because of who Jesus Christ is and what he has done for us. And that holiness of God has not gone away because of Jesus. Jesus has fulfilled the holiness of God and he's died on the cross so that we could live holy, that we could be made holy. And we are also to treat everyone, including animals, in spite of all the animal sacrifices that God has given us instructions about in Leviticus. There's also this teaching in Leviticus that every person, and even the animals, there is a certain way that they are to be handled, and it is to be done with respect and fairness and love. And Matthew 7, 12 is, a, is the golden rule. is a great way just to kind of cover all of that. Treat others as you would want to be treated. God desires sexual purity between one man and woman in marriage, period. That's what all of Leviticus 18 says. Leviticus 18 describes every form of sexual impurity and every sexual act that is not that. So if it's not this, it's wrong, period, right? That's what Leviticus proclaims, and that's what the New Testament affirms over and over again. Now, I want to pause there because I want to give you a few minutes and I kind of went really quick through the book of Leviticus. There's, I, I skipped an awful lot of stuff, okay? But I think I've covered enough to kind of give you a gist of an overview of what this book is about. And you'll, you'll see there, I've, I've put four questions down there that I would like for you to take just a few moments to kind of just read out together around your table and maybe just kind of share a few brief reflections. What are some of the aspects of the gospel of Christ as laid out in Leviticus that are missed or most under, misunderstood today? What are areas of life that might people today not take God's holiness seriously enough? You could spend all night talking about that. 
What human relationships today fall short of God's instructions in Leviticus? And what should, what should worship of holy God look like today according to Leviticus in light of Christ and the New Testament? I know these are some big questions. Uh, you've got 10 minutes. All right, go. Go. <clears throat>